Hello, and thanks for joining. My name is Abi Goyle, and I'm a cardiologist at the Emory University School of Medicine. On behalf of our multidisciplinary team, it is my pleasure to present these clinical protocols on high-sensitivity troponin testing. The goal of this talk is to educate frontline providers in the ED, on the inpatient wards, and in the ICU on the correct use and interpretation of high-sensitivity troponin I tests for diagnosing myocardial injury and myocardial infarction. While well, Europe has been using HS troponin testing for over five years, U.S. hospitals are still transitioning to HS troponin testing. HS troponin testing is more sensitive and more precise at low concentrations than standard troponin. HS troponin testing does allow for faster MI rollouts, and it does lead uh, to more efficient ED throughput. But the trade-off for a more sensitive test is that it is less specific for treatable heart attacks or type 1 in STEMIs and will increase the rate of detection of non-ischemic myocardial injury in type 2 MI that don't necessarily warrant treatment or change management. So we have to be smart about how we use and interpret this test. Before we discuss the troponin protocols, let's highlight some key differences between standard troponin and high sensitivity troponin. Please note that our hospitals test for cardiac troponin I and not cardiac troponin T. First, note that we're used to seeing standard troponin in nanograms per ml. In these units, we are used to seeing values up to two decimal places, particularly for values less than one nanogram per ml. On the other hand, high sensitivity troponin is measured in nanograms per liter, which is different by a factor of a thousand. And because of that, values are reported only as integers. So a value of 100 nanograms per liter for HS troponin would be the equivalent of a standard troponin value of 0.1 nanograms per ml. The second key observation is that standard troponin had a common cut point for abnormal for women and men. But for high sensitivity troponin, there are sex specific cut points. For women, any value at or above 15 nanograms per liter will be flagged as abnormal. For men, any value at or above 20 nanograms per liter would be flagged as abnormal. This is a clinical protocol for HS troponin for use in the emergency department only. It is not intended to apply to patients already admitted to the inpatient wards or who are in the ICUs. This protocol synthesizes patient symptoms, duration of symptoms, ECG findings, the heart score, which is a synthesis of history, ECG findings, age, risk factors, and troponin values, uh, which will also be shown in more detail on the next slide, their individual troponin values, and their delta troponin values, or the change in troponin. The change in troponin is calculated by subtracting a baseline troponin value from a subsequent troponin value. Note that this is a 0, 1, and 3 hour troponin protocol where typically the 0 and 1 hour troponin values will be pre-checked on an ED order pathway and the 3 hour will be unchecked but optionally be, may be checked later depending on the results of your 0 and 1 hour tests. A key objective of this protocol is to stratify patients into low-risk, intermediate-risk, or high-risk groups. Patients in the low-risk category are typically defined as those with an anticipated less than 1% risk of death or MI at 30-day follow-up. And these patients generally could be considered safe for discharge and early outpatient follow-up uh, from the ED. Conversely, the high-risk patients are those who have concerning enough troponin values or uh, a steep enough rise in troponin from baseline to a subsequent value, and these patients may require cardiology consultation uh, and or admission. In between, we have the intermediate risk group. Many of these patients would uh, be eligible for staying in a clinical decision unit or an observation unit, and many would undergo 
observation and stress testing or other cardiac imaging, and depending on the results of those tests, could then be subsequently uh, discharged or uh, have cardiology consultation or admission. Shown here is the heart score for use in the ED, as mentioned on the previous slide. This slide shows the troponin protocol for patients already admitted to inpatient wards and the ICUs. It is not intended for patients in the ED. If the patient has chest pain or develops chest pain that sounds ischemic and an ECG shows STEMI criteria, you don't even bother with measuring troponin right away and instead you follow the hospital's inpatient STEMI protocol, which may include uh, immediate cath lab activation. If conversely the patient has pain that does not sound ischemic as shown on the left and the ECG does not show evidence of acute ischemia, then you may not even need to order eye sensitivity troponin test because it is unlikely that in the absence of ischemic sounding pain or ECG findings this patient is having a myocardial infarction. If the patient has chest pain that sounds ischemic and or an ECG that may be ischemic, then you go to the middle section where you would order troponin and ECG at 0 and 3 hours. Note that uh, unlike the ED protocol, this is a 0 and 3 hour protocol with optional check at 6 hours. There is no 1 hour check because that would be impractical on the inpatient setting. If your troponins are within the reference range and the delta or the rise in troponin is less than 5 nanograms per liter, then it would go to the yellow box and suggest there is no myocardial injury, but you could image the patient for myocardial ischemia depending on symptoms. If there is uh, a rise in troponin by more than 5 nanograms per liter, uh, then you would order a 6-hour troponin. If at any point the troponin is greater than 15 in women or 20 in men, that is consistent with myocardial injury, for which we will go into more detail on the next slide. This is the final slide of this talk, and it shows how we classify and document patients with different types of myocardial injury and myocardial infarction. There is a lot to unpack here, and because of that, we will be posting a separate talk on this issue. Uh, briefly, once we find out the patient has myocardial injury or any troponin value above the 99th percentile, the next question to ask is, is there clinical evidence of overt myocardial ischemia? If there are no ischemic symptoms, no ECG changes, and no abnormalities on cardiac imaging, as shown on the left, we do not call it an acute MI, and we call it non-ischemic myocardial injury, and we document the underlying cause. If, however, there is evidence of overt myocardial ischemia, as shown on the right, meaning there are symptoms of ischemia and or ischemic ECG changes, abnormality on cardiac imaging, or an abnormal cardiac angiogram, then we call that acute MI. If we think there is an underlying precipitant for type 2 MI, then we document a type 2 MI because the underlying mechanism is supply-demand mismatch. If angiography confirms or we strongly suspect acute coronary artery plaque rupture or erosion, then we would document type 1 and STEMI, and that would warrant a cardiology consult in many cases and treatment per and STEMI guidelines. Please note that for many patients with non-ischemic myocardial injury and type 2 MI, we should not treat them reflexively with IV heparin because it is often not indicated and may even be harmful in patients with non-ischemic injury and type 2 MI. We will be covering these examples and showing cases in a subsequent talk. For now, thanks very much for joining us.